God. And it was to Moloch that the people would offer their babies, their infants, as sacrifices to be killed to this God. Does that sound familiar? Why do you suppose that in the book of Amos you find the phrase, Seek the Lord and thou shalt live? Because the God of the Bible is all about life. He's all about living. And they had embraced, especially those ten northern tribes, all these gods. This is why Tyre or Tyrus is mentioned in chapter number two. That's, that was the home of the Phoenicians. Dennis knows that because he lived in those areas. South, South Lebanon to this day, it's still there. Sidon and Tyrus or Tyre is it, as it's called. So um, the eight nations are mentioned in chapters one and two. And tonight we're going to be looking at three sermons that Amos pronounces. And then next week we'll finish up with chapters seven, eight, and nine, part three. Uh, five visions that he announces that he professes or that he proclaims all right here are the three sermons we're going to look at the first sermon in chapter three which is israel's privilege despised in other words they had it so good they were, they 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 were they, man economically they were those 10 northern tribes were doing great they were doing well and this guy shows up and he says man you have lost touch of who God is. He drives the whole issue home of their idol worship and embracing the gods of Molech and all the Phoenician gods and all those gods that God told the 10 northern tribes to stay away from. And if you remember, those of you that were in Israel with me in 2018, we cruised around some of those areas, some of those places, like Caesarea Philippi. Remember when we were at Caesarea Philippi and we sat down and it was there where Jesus opened up the word and he, to the 12 disciples, he asked them the question, who do men say that I am? And not only does he stop there, but in Matthew 16, he takes it a step further and he says, not only am I asking you who do men say that I am, but who do you say that I am? Why was he asking that question in that place because it was the heart it was the mecca of pagan worship as a matter of fact right down the path from where jesus sat with the disciples was this massive cave with no bottom to it which the greeks believed was the entrance to hell to hades this is why jesus says to them in that same very same verse that it's in this place where I'm going to build my rock. Not in this place, but through you guys, I'm going to build my rock. And the gates of hell will not, what? Prevail against it. There's your setting. There's your context. So whatever Jesus said, and he did, he did it strategically with a purpose to communicate a profound and a significant truth. Well, where's this area of Philippi? Look at the map. It's just north of where Amos shows up in Bethel. That's where all the pagan, the hotbed of paganism and all the crazy stuff that was playing out with those 10 northern tribes and says, man, we better get right because judgment is coming. It's crazy where our culture is at right now in terms of their hatred and their despise. For the very good, for the very things of God. As a matter of fact, in the book of um, in the book of Amos, look at chapter five. I believe it's like eighteen. I want you to see this other word or this other phrase that shows up in the text. I think I have it over here in these notes. Look at chapter five. I think it's eighteen. No, no, that's not it. Um, verse fourteen, actually. Not only does he say to these guys, seek God and you, sh and, and you shall live, like he says to them in verse number four and verse number eight, but look what he says to them in verse 14. Seek God, I'm sorry, seek good and not evil. Isn't that an interesting truth that Amos is driving home with 
the people of the north. He says to them, see good and not evil that ye may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you as he have spoken. What an incredible promise that is. What an incredible truth that is. So not only does he challenge them to seek God so they shall live, he also says, man, seek good and not evil. Why? So that ye shall live. Man, look at our world today. Look at the hatred for God today. Man, I saw a video today that just disgusted me with a young protester. And some of the vulgar things that she was saying to these black street preachers claiming the blood of Jesus over that event. You guys should see it. Look it up. It was crazy what she said to the guy. We're there, man. We're there. This is a warning. But know this. Know this. There's a backstory playing out, huh? Isn't there? What's the backstory? This. This. Boaz is still waiting and preparing his bride. So, um, let's look at chapter number three real quick. Just highlight a few thoughts, a few ideas from this chapter um, as it relates to, it's, it's working now, huh, Marv? Okay. You don't know what it's doing, huh? Okay, that's the battery? Okay. All righty. Um, where did I tell you to turn? Chapter 3. Oh. Yeah. I, um, I, I call these sermons um, in chapters 3, 4, 5, and 6 because that's exactly what you find are three very distinct and very unique sermons. The first one you're going to see in chapter 3, it's Israel's privilege being despised because of all their wealth, because of all their prosperity, but, but no connection with God whatsoever. In chapter 2, he drives home their perversity and he describes it in great detail. And then in chapter, oh, I'm sorry, in chapters five and six, that's chapter four actually. And then the third sermon is Israel's punishment is declared in chapters five and six. And sure enough, it came about, right? We just saw chapter five, verse 18. What is the context when you see the phrase, the day of the Lord? What's the, what's the, what's the day of the Lord? Second coming. Do you have your Bibles with you? Look at how, look at how the verse reads. This is crazy. Chapter 5, verse number 18. Woe! Remember those? What does the word woe mean in the Greek? Like the three woes in the book of Revelation, chapter 16. It means I. I. A-Y-E. I, I, I. Woe, he says, verse 18. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. Are you really you sure you want the second coming to happen? Woe unto you that want the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? For the day of the Lord is darkness and not light. That's going to be a crazy event, right? We talked about it in some detail a few weeks ago. Go back and look at our study in Joel chapter 2, which details the if the second coming event in a lot of ways. Remember our, our, we did the map. I still owe you a map, do I not? I didn't send it yet. Larry keeps bugging me for it, so you'll get the map. You'll get all those outlines, I promise, Tish, so you don't have to be taking photos. Um, hey, the printer's up though, right? That high-speed printer is up, so we can start printing that stuff. There's a new printer in the back. Right, Sylvia, does it work? Yeah, cool. So, so in chapter three, um, is where we're at. We're going to talk about how God uses this, um, this, these sermons to really, really call out the people of God. And if there's ever a time that we need to be called out, and again, you guys that know me, um, I don't blame the culture for where we're at, for the things that are happening. Um, I own this part. Uh, the church is the group, the group, the folks that should be indicted in terms of why things are the way they are because it did fall asleep for a lot of decades, man. And we just played church. We failed to pass on who God is to the next generation and the next generation. Well, guess what? That generation now controls the world. The next, this, that generation, they're now 
congressmen and congresswomen at 30, 31, 32 years old. You know them as the, uh, what does the news media call them? As the, the what? You know what I'm talking about. The squad. You know them as the squad. <laughs> Jack knows. They're the squad. Go look up who the squad is, man. And you'll know why we're where we're at. Um, a bunch of young Marxist, leftist, U.S. hating people, man. And they just despise. And now they are in positions of leadership in our country. Congresswomen. As a matter of fact, that should speak volumes. So, preaching and the power of preaching. Let me just share a couple thoughts about preaching before we start looking at this. Like I said, I'm just going to be highlighting some thoughts from each chapter anyway. So it's not like, um, like we're going to be dissecting all these passages. But I want to just share with you why and how God used Amos as he preached God's word. Um, I don't know if you know this, but there's a difference in the scriptures between teaching and preaching God's word. I am so grateful um, for the Lord leading me to a church where I first, when I first encountered God's word, it was in a Monday night Bible study where I was being taught. And then that teaching of God's word then led me to showing up on Sundays to this same church, which for about six months I would go there at nine o'clock and then I would jump in the car and Larry would tell you, and we'd drive down to St. Bernadette's and we do the mass thing, and we did it for a long time. I just wanted to cover all the bases, man, till the Lord saved my soul. And then once that happened, but it was in the preaching of God's word where he began to change me, where true, genuine repentance began to happen in my life. And this is why the Bible contrasts the two. As a matter of fact, you see it in the life of Jesus. In fact, take your Bibles and turn with me to the gospel of matthew 28 i'm going to share with you a couple verses you know them as the great commission right matthew 28 i'm going to show you the 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 great commission from three perspectives from the three what we know in the new testament is the synoptic gospels right what are the synoptic gospels some of you have been around for a while there's four gospels right that give us the life of christ matthew mark luke and john john is a unique account of Jesus' life. You don't find the same accounts and the same stories in John's gospel that you find in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're known as the synoptic gospels. Here's what's really cool, and I've shared this with you, right? The, the thing that makes us unique and different from our pets and from other, any other creature on the planet is that we have a what? You have a soul. That when you were born, God breathed life into you and you became a living soul. But what does the soul consist of? Three things, right? The mind, the heart, and the what? And the eye? The body, no. The mind, the heart, and the will. What's the will? It's that part of your being, that part of your soul that makes choices that makes decisions. Remember that? Well, here's what's interesting. The choices that you make is dependent on what you take into your mind that affects your heart. So what you take into your mind intellectually will affect who you are emotionally. And then that results in a decision or a choice that you make in life, typically. And the issue and the challenge with so many people today, and we've already talked about this, There's so much blindness where we're letting our feelings dictate the choices and the decisions that we make. This is why we have a uh, a cancel culture. This is why we have so many people getting offended for this, that, and the other. Why? Because their feelings, which are subjective, are driving who they are. So as it was, and in those days there's no king in Israel, and every man did which was right in what? In his own eyes. It's all about you. Laodicea means people's rights. This is the culture today. This is where we find ourselves, where we have reversed. We have actually interchanged the heart with the mind and we are giving more priority to the feelings 
than we do the mind. This is why, as you study the scriptures, as you lay out the word of God, look at, uh, for example, first, Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, where Paul says to Timothy, God didn't give you a spirit of what? Fear, which is an emotional thing, but of what? Power, love, and what? He didn't say sound heart. He said a sound mind. If you go back and you study the, the armor of God in the book of Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 6, there's seven pieces that are mentioned. And the very first thing that God says is to gird up your loins with truth. Physically, these are your loins, your quads. Physically, on your body, this is the strongest bo body part that you have. You know what's cool about the scriptures? He's revealing to us some spiritual truths. It has nothing to do with my physical body. What am I supposed to do? Put my Bible over my loin part? To girt my loins with truth? Right? No. You know what he's saying to you and to me? Gird up the loins because in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, Peter defines the loins. He says, gird up the loins of your what? Your mind. So what you allow in your head matters. What you read matters. What you watch matters. I experienced that today. I would find myself just, oh, I'm just going to check the results, see what's going on, and I'm seeing I'm this crazy news, and I'm, I'm getting in the flesh. I'm getting emotional. Not emotional, crybaby kind of emotional. But I'm getting angry. I'm getting a little frustrated with what I see going on in my beloved country. And I'd have to set that phone down and just pray and get clean and get back into his word where he's cleansing my mind. And then that calmed my heart. And then I made the right choice. So I went to the fridge and got a water instead of a shot of tequila. <laughs> Not that I would do that. Larry would, but I wouldn't. Right, Larry? But see what, see what I'm getting at? See where things will lead us when this isn't where it needs to be. And in the Gospel of Matthew, look at, listen to what Jesus, the very last words that he says to his disciples as he's preparing them, as he's preparing to leave them, and as he prepares them by passing the baton to them, we know this as the Great Commission, right? Look what he says. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and do what? And teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And look what he says in verse number 20. Doing what? Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And to I am with you always, even in the end of the world. You know what I love about how God organizes his word? Matthew comes before Mark, right? So if the mind is the first priority, what is teaching about? Instilling truth. Doctrine. What does God's word say? Teaching them to observe all things. Having a sound mind. Girding up your loins with truth. Gird up the loins of your mind with truth. What's truth? Lord, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now look at how Mark depicts this same passage. Mark's account of the Great Commission. Look at chapter 16, the very last chapter, the very last few words in the text. Look at verse number 15. Mark chapter number 16, verse 15. And he said unto them, there's the word go, just like in the book of Matthew, right? And he said unto them, who are the them, by the way? The disciples, the 11, not the 12. By this time, Judas Iscariot is gone. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world and do what? And preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. I love that because now he's saying what? preach why did he say teach in Matthew and preach in Mark you know why that is it's 
God is bringing balance to how he deals with us. He's dealing with the mind and the heart because it's with the heart that you're ultimately going to affect the choices that you make. This is where repentance happens. This is where God is revealing to you and to me the issues and the sin in your life so that you could change your path. The preaching and the power of God's word. Isn't that awesome how God provides that perfect balance? Again, Proverbs 11, 1, a false balance is abomination unto the Lord, but a just weight is what? His delight. I know a lot of dudes out there that all they do is preach, 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 man. And all they, and then these other guys that all they do is teach, teach, teach. You got to do both. We have to do both. We have to preach and teach because if people don't know the word of God, all I'm doing, instead of feeding the flock, what am I doing? I'm beating the flock. Look at how Luke lays out the Great Commission. Look at chapter 24, the last chapter in Luke. Verses 46 through 48. says in verse number 46 and he said unto them thus it is wow look at this one look, thus it is written and thus it is behooved uh, be- behoved that Christ to suffer and to rise from the, de- from the dead the third day and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in the name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem and here's verse 48 and ye are witnesses of these what of these things now you are to do what? You are to be a witness. You are to live these things. There's the will. There's the balance. Mind, heart, will. Teach, preach, live. Be a witness to the things. And this is how God begins to work in our lives. This is how he begins to use you. How he begins to use me in the life of others. That we are to be that light, the example of the salt and the light that this world desperately needs like ever ever before. So this guy shows up and you know what he's doing? He's teaching and he's preaching. That's what he does in the first two chapters when he lays out their history. Where he lays out who all these kingdoms are. And now in chapter 3 he says, "All right, man, I'm going to take the gloves off a little bit. And now we're going to deal with the heart. We're going to deal with the heart issues. Do you guys remember these words by Paul to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter number 4? Immediately after talking about the end times and the last days in chapter number 3 where he says in verse 1, in the last days perilous times shall come. He says don't ever forget that these are going to be the conditions. These are going to be the characteristics of the people living in the last days. And there's a whole litany of things that we're going to be talking about at some point. But look at how the chapter closes or how the book closes. He says to Timothy in verse number one, he says, Timothy, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and at his kingdom. That's an interesting verse. He mentions two judgments in that one verse and those two judgments are in your uh, your timeline. Look at verse two. And he says this next in. Teach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, and all long suffering and doctrine. Is that what he said? Preach. Timothy, I need you to preach the word. We need to preach the word with all long suffering, with care, and some doctrine. Why? So that the hearts of men could change. Look at verse 3 for the time will come, for the time will come, and we're there, folks. He's writing about the, about the time in which we live. For the time will come when they shall not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. That's what I was getting back earlier. All, all the, the, the church has been asleep for the last several decades where we've come to church and all we want to do is have itching ears and give me something good so I can walk out and just learning some knowledge and learning some theology and learning this and learning that but no real genuine transformation 
or repentance going on in the hearts of the people in the body of Christ. For the time will come where they shall endure, they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their eyes from the what? From the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. Anybody know what a fable is? What's a fable? It's a story. Man, there's a lot of preacher dudes on TV that are great, 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 great storytellers. They'll tell you to turn the Bible, to take your Bible and turn to the book of Amos chapter 3 <laughs> and never really get into the text, right? And all of a sudden they'll read a verse or two verses and they're off telling some really cool stories that are inspiring, that are cool, that are awesome and never letting God's word really speak to us. This is why in our church we go expository in our preaching. What does that mean? Verse by verse. Verse by verse. Because that's how and where God is really speaking is through his word. And there's nothing subjective about it. And you know what? That's exactly what's going on in the world today. So it's no coincidence that we have a church, I'm not talking about you guys, but generally the church, corporately, that knows nothing about the Bible that doesn't know the Bible. The culture doesn't know the Bible. How do we know? Anybody ever watch Jeopardy? Whenever they have the Bible categories, nobody knows the Bible categories. It's, it's, it's crazy to me. Larry could have won 60th grand the other day because she knew all the answers in this one category. I said, you need to join Jeopardy. I'm going to call Alex Trebek and get you on the show. Smart people but absolutely no concept of the things of God. And we wonder why things are the way they are. There's no knowledge of God in the land, Hosea said in Hosea chapter number four. We've lost a complete, an entire generation of young people. This is why Amos shows up and preaches these sermons. Do you guys want to look at the sermons real quick? All right. In verses 1 and 3, he drives home Israel's judgment is going to be equal to their privilege. Wow, that's heavy, huh? We were having a meeting here the other day, and we were just kind of talking amongst ourselves with all that's going on in the chaos, and um, we were talking about who may win or who may not win or who become the next president, and I don't really worry or focus too much, although I do care. Um, there's certain principles and biblical values that I adhere to is why I'm going to support a, a certain agenda, a certain candidate. But for me, it's really not about who the person is more than it is about the beauty and the incredible aspects of what we know as the U.S. Constitution. That's what made this country so special and so unique is that document. It is an amazing piece, man. Now, I don't know if you know this about the U.S. Constitution, but it was the result of a previous document that the pilgrims brought with them known as the Magna Carta. As a matter of fact, you can see the original Magna Carta and the Constitution at the National Archives in D.C. right there in the same room. It's really an awesome thing to see. Well, you know what the source of the Magna Carta was? This book right here. That was the source document to the Magna Carta. And we were having this discussion and we were talking about who might win or who will win. And you know what I said? America, America, we are going to get the president that we deserve. That's what's going to happen. And that might be a scary notion for a lot of us, for a lot of you, but that's, what God and how God works in the word. He's in control. No question, no doubt. Go read Daniel chapter 2, verse 21 sometime. He puts kings into power and he removes kings. We're bound to this timeline, whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not. God's plan is coming to fruition. So I'm, I'm here to say to you, don't worry, wor don't worry, fret not, right? 
Uh, be careful for nothing, Paul says to the Philippians, but in everything through prayer and supplication, what? Let your request be known. You ought to be praying, and whoever wins, be praying for them. 1 Timothy chapter 2, we'll run. for those that are kings and those in authority. When Paul penned those words, anybody know who was king? Anybody have any idea who was the president of the Roman Empire during the days of Peter and the Apostle Paul? Nero. A perverted, pagan dirtbag that despised believers. And Paul has the audacity to tell us to pray for them. That's the God of the Bible. But you know why he asks us to pray for them. And this should be our prayer when we pray for them. Go check it out. This is a cool passage, man. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 6. So they could leave us alone. So they could leave us alone to do what God has called us to do. And that is to see people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. This, is you sure that's enough? Check it out. That all men, that all men, Paul says in verse 4 of chapter 3, that all men might be what? Might be saved. That all men might be saved. That's where you find in the very next verse, verse 5, is the infamous verse that there's only one mediator between God and man. That is the man Christ Jesus. He's who we pray to. He's who we go to in asking for grace and mercy and light and testimony so, can, so that we can reach a broken, lost, and dying world. And part of that responsibility includes and so much involves the truth in preaching the truth, in revealing the truth. Because if we don't teach and reveal truth, what's going to be the opposite effect? And we're talking about that on Sunday mornings. What's the word? Deception. You will be deceived. And the world is deceived like never before. So if you want to know and understand why things are the way they are, why, who knows, I pray this doesn't happen. But if it happens, it, it's not going to surprise me. Because it happened to Israel in 1 Kings chapter number 12. It, it happened in 1860. And don't tell me it can't happen in 2020. War. Listen to the words of Jesus in Matthew 12, verse 25, as he was dealing with the Pharisees, a religious crowd, about his kingdom. And the rejection of his kingdom. He says these words to them. And Jesus knew their thoughts. And he said unto them. Every kingdom divided against itself. Is brought to what? To desolation. Did you catch that? Every kingdom divided against itself. Is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself. What does he say next? shall not stand so don't be too freaked out if some radical things began to happen in our culture but where should we be focused on the mission focused on our purpose so this is what he drives home in those first three verses in Amos chapter number three he says to them in verse three hear the word that the Lord has spoken against you, O oh, what? O oh, children of Israel. He's talking to God's people. Against the whole family which is brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Wow, that's pretty heavy, isn't it? Man, things were going good. Things were going great up north. And everybody was out just doing their thing, offering their babies up to Moloch, their pagan religion. Opulence was there, wealth. And God says, all right, Amos, I got a job for you, buddy. 
Go prophesy unto my people Israel. Look at verse 3. This is a crazy verse. This, again, just validates what Jesus said in verse Matthew 12, verse 42 that we just read a minute ago. He says in verse number 3, Can two walk together except they be agreed? Can they? I don't think so. Have you watched the news recently? On those barriers between two different groups? Constantly? I'm not even talking about law enforcement. Sometimes law enforcement is caught in the middle. I don't know what's going to happen, man. But it's not going to be good. We're going to have to be ready and prepared to not lose sight of our mission. Verses 4 through 7, God's calling and using the prophets, including Amos, for one final warning. This was their role. This is why they showed up in the first place. Remember that from our overview f- several weeks ago? Why are the prophets here? Two reasons. To foretell? To ca- talk about the coming events, right? That's prophecy or visions. And also to what? Foretell. What's foretelling? Preach the truth. The world needs truth. <laughs> like never before. It says in verse 4, With a li- will, will a lion roar in the forest when he hath no prey? Will a young lion cry out of his den if he hath taken nothing? Can a bird fall in a snare upon the earth where no gin is for him? Shall one take up a snare from the earth and have nothing at all? Shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in a city, and the Lord hath not done it? Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto what? The servants, the prophets. He's making some things known to those that are genuinely seeking God so that people could have life so that we could live. He's the revelator. He's the one that sheds light on anything and everything. And in verses 11 through 15, you see the Lord describing through Amos, Israel's judgment defined in some detail. Let's look at these verses. Verse number 11. It says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, an adversary, there shall be even round about the land, right? Who are those adversaries? Go back to chapter 2. And he shall bring down thy strength from thee, and thy palaces shall be spoiled, thus saith the Lord, as the shepherd taketh out the mouth of the lion with two legs or, or a piece of an ear, so shall the children of Israel be taken out to dwell in Samaria, in the corner of a bed, and in Damascus, in a couch. Samaria becomes very strategic in and during the second coming of Christ. Those of you that when we were in Israel together, remember, uh, remember Tish on the camel, riding the camel around, and she was, that's Samaria. That is the act, that was the capital of the Samaritan region. It was where we bought the little coins from the little guy, Sylvia. And remember whose palace was just up the road? Whose palace was still there? One of the most wicked kings that Israel ever had. What was his name? Ahab. Ahab and Wu. Jezebel, that's right. Two interesting characters in the Bible. The Ahabs are starting to show up on the scene prophetically. Let me give you a hint. Start studying the French president, Macron, and his background. Interesting cat. Interesting character. His history, his race, his background, his beliefs. Interesting dude.
Verse 13, Hear ye and testify in the house of Jacob, saith the Lord God, the God of hosts, that in the day that I shall visit the transgressions of Israel upon him, I will also visit the altars of Bethel. There's the city of Bethel. That's the place that Amos made his way to. And the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. And I will smite the winter house and the summer house and the houses of ivory that perish. And the great houses shall have an end, saith the Lord. Wow. Wow. All those mansions, all those cool subdivisions on the foothills of Samaria are going to come tumbling down. Chapter 4. Over here, Amos begins to describe Israel's perverseness. Uh, This is not a very long chapter, just a few verses, 13 verses. So let's just read through it and we'll just unpack a couple thoughts as we read through the chapter, it says in verse 4, Hear the word, ye king of Bashan, that are in the mountains of Samaria. If you remember, Bashan was that region on the east side of the Jordan where those two Hivite kings were from that Joshua killed. Those two giant kings, remember that? That's Bashan. And the kings of Bashan uh, that are in the mountain of Samaria, which oppress the poor, which crush the needy, which say to their masters, bring and let us drink. You know what these people were doing? They could care less about the poor in their midst. It was all about greed. It was all, all about what's in it for me. What can I get? And lost sight. And God calls them out here in verse number one. Actually, Amos does through the Lord's word. The Lord God had sworn by his holiness that lo, the days shall come upon you that he will take you with hawks and your posterity with fish hooks. And ye shall go out at the beaches, every cow at that which is before her, and ye shall uh, cast them into the palace, saith the Lord. Come to Bethel and transgress at Gilgal and bring your sacrifices every morning and your tithes after three years and offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven And proclaim and publish the free offerings for this liketh you, O ye children of Israel, saith the Lord God. Even their sacrifices were disgusting to God. Their church going was meaningless. There was no real purpose behind their devotion. Verse 6, And I also have given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities, and want the bread in all your places, yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. A people that have forgotten who God is. And all that he did for them. And all that he was to them. As they embraced all the pagan gods and all the pagan beliefs in the north. You see now why God said to Joshua, when you enter the land, to what? To just utterly destroy all that stuff? They cut a deal with who? With the Hivites, who were still present during the days of Amos. Verse 7, also I have withholding the rain from you when there were yet three months to the harvest and I caused it to rain upon the city and caused it not to rain upon another city. One piece was rained upon and the other piece whereupon it rained not withered. I don't know if you guys paid much attention with what went on in California just in the last couple of months but it was crazy what happened in a lot of those forests. So two or three cities wandered unto one city to drink water and they were not satisfied yet. Have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord? I have smitten you with blasting and mildew when your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increased. Palmer worm devoured them, yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Wow. A people that just don't get it that don't realize that there's a power out there that is bringing about 
some punishment, to use the word that Amos used in verse 1. Verse 10, I have sent them among the pestilence after the manner of Egypt. Your young men have I slain with the sword and have taken away your horses and I have made the stink of your camps to come up under your nostrils. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord? I have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Interesting that that would be introduced into the text. I don't know what you know about Sodom and Gomorrah, but go back and read Genesis chapters 18 and 19 sometime if you want to know what was going on there. And it's exactly what's going on here. And you were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning, and ye have ye, and have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord? Therefore thus will I do unto thee, O Israel. And because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. Man, what a powerful verse that is. That was one of our key thoughts in our intro slide. Prepare, O Israel, to meet God. When you start to see chaos and hopelessness and despair and uncertainty, you know what God is saying to us on this timeline? Prepare to meet God. Prepare to meet God. From a church age perspective, then there's this other little dispensation known as the tribulation period. Israel, prepare to meet God. Amos chapter number 5, which we'll read in a minute. Are you seeing the progression here? Are you seeing the structure and the order of this incredible prophecy? Where did I leave off? 12? Verse 13. For lo, <coughs> he that formeth the mountains and createth the wind and declareth unto man what is his thought that maketh the morning darkness and treadeth upon the high places of the earth. The Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. Do you remember what I shared with everybody on Sunday? When we were talking about the latency in church age, the last church that is mentioned in Revelation chapter 4, before, Re Revelation chapter 3, verse number 14 and 15, before the rapture, what were the two titles that Jesus had to give himself in your red letter Bible? What are the two major titles that he called himself? The what? The amen? It's the first one. Which means what? Truth. Isn't it interesting? Don't you find it interesting that Jesus had to re refer to himself as the truth in the last church period before the rapture? Why? Because there is no truth. The lukewarm church, the Laodicean age, the rights of the people age, and then what else did he call it, refer to himself as as well? The faithful and true witness, and then the third one, the beginning of the creation of God. Jesus had to remind the Laodiceans, don't forget, man, I'm the creator. I created all this in these last two verses, just like he's having to remind us, the people in our culture, in our age, have, who have totally embraced evolutionary thought. You want to know why it's going to be easy to kill a bunch of people? Because that's the mindset of an atheist. A guy or a, or, a, or a young lady who believes in, I'm not going to say young lady, or anybody who believes in evolutionary beliefs is what? Survival of the fittest. So now you are susceptible. This is why abortion is not a big deal. The next thing that will play out will be some form of eugenics or some form of um, euthanasia for people that are impact on society. Watch this economy start to crash and burn a little bit then some folks will become a little bit more expendable than others. I would encourage everybody in this room to get online and look up which, what are known as the Georgia Guidestones if you want to see a New World Order agenda. England's got, what are those stones in England? Stonehenge. America's got the Georgia Guidestones. Check them out. If you want to see the real agenda of the globalists, the globalist agenda. So 
So, man, he really, he really brings it home, man. I don't know about you, man. Every time I step out on my front porch and I look up at the night sky, I'm in absolute awe of my God. In Romans chapter number one, can I show you an interesting thought in Romans one? If you want to know why we're where we're at as a people, we forgot and we neglect these two significant witnesses that God left in each and every heart. Romans 1. I think the first verse is going to be verse number 17. But I want to share with you what happens to a people that forgets or denies the Creator. There's a reason why Jesus had to refer to himself as the Creator in Revelation chapter 3. Verse 1, I told you to go, right? Uh, look at verse 17. I think it is 17. Verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, Paul says, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And Jesus died for everybody. Jew and Gentile is the whole notion when he refers to the Greek. Verse number 17, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heavens against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. In other words, God is revealing to people exactly what Amos laid out to the ten northern tribes in the book of Amos, chapter number 4. It says in verse number 19 now, Because that which may be known of God is made manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. In other words, what God is saying to you is He's left you a witness Every soul on the planet that has ever existed, God says, I gave you a witness of who I am. You know what that's called? This internal witness? Your conscience. Remember your dispensational chart when you went from innocent to what? After the fall to conscience. What does the word conscience mean? Two, two syllables. With knowledge. You know. You know the difference between right and wrong. But when a conscience gets seared, anything goes. So God says, I'm giving every lost man, woman, and child that ever lived, that has a soul, a conscience, so that they could determine the difference between the knowledge of good and evil, the garden. Look at verse number 20. Not only does he give us an internal witness, he also gives you an out or an external witness. For the invisible things from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Anytime you see the word Godhead in Scripture, he's referring to who he is in the triune God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Godhead is the Trinity. Look at this. So that, they're, so that they are without excuse. In other words, I've, not only have I given you an internal witness, I've also given you creation to reveal to every lost man, woman, and child that I'm the creator, that there is a creator. I get so annoyed at these theologians on YouTube or whatever that are trying to teach about the reality of God and they refer to him as, or they refer to it as intelligent design. Just call him God. Just call him Jesus. Because in Colossians 1, verse number 9, Paul says, that Jesus is the one that created all that we see. Why? Because he is the triune God. He is part of the Trinity. Look at the next verse. Verse 21. These two witnesses, because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were, what? There it is, mark it down. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their own imaginations, and in their foolish heart, and their foolish heart was darkened. Pro pro professing themselves to be wise, they what? They became fools. Now here's where the downward spiral, the apostasy begins. You know where it begins in everybody's heart? By not being thankful. When we lose sight of the blessings, you look at these little anarchists that are out there that are trying to change 
who we are and what we're about, they have lost any notion or any concept and how grateful they should be of where it is that they live and how blessed we genuinely are. Seriously, Stevie Wonder, two days ago, telling the world that it's time to pay up reparations and the guy who has, he's worth like 110 million. Dude, you're one blessed dude from this country and I would wake up each and every day and I would encourage everybody to just wake up each and every day and the first thing that comes out of your mouth is Lord, thank you. Thank you for who you are in my life. If not, your apostasy will kick in. And when we, st- when we stop having a grateful heart is when we start looking and blaming everybody for everything that is wrong in our lives and we go from being victor to being a what? A victim. The power of a grateful heart. Paul, the Apostle Paul in Second Timothy chapter number 3 when he's talking about unperilous times one of the characteristics is unthankfulness why do you suppose that every time the word of God is referring to prayer he always says pray with a grateful heart thankful enter into his gates how with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise what are those gates the physical gates in your Nice little subdivision. I'm not talking about those gates. What gates is he referring to in the New Testament? Your eyes, your ears. Lift up your head, O ye gates, it says in the 24th Psalm. And the King of glory shall come in. Lift up your head, O ye gates. And the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? David writes, the Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. You'll never recognize him for who he is if you don't lift up and open those gates and start with a grateful heart. It won't happen. And how grateful are we really for how blessed we are as a people, as a nation. You want to know why we're where we're at? People lost sight of who God is. So if there is no God, what are you going to be grateful? Who are you going to be grateful to? Right? Right? doesn't even make sense it doesn't jive now you could be thankful to your wife or your parent or whatever but you'll never be grateful to and for the creator if you don't even believe that he exists and we wonder why we're burning cities and we're burning flags and we're tearing things apart isn't the bible spot on it really is isn't it Chapter number five. And six, Israel's punishment is now declared. But the cool thing about God, like he always does, he always provides a way out. And the way out that is declared in these two chapters, or in chapter five especially, is this final invitation that he always extends to all of us before punishment. And you know what that is? Look at verse 4. For thus saith the Lord unto the house of Israel, Seek me, and ye shall what? There you go. That's the key to life. You know what our message should be to the world? Seek him. Seek Him. He's your only hope. That is our message to a lost and dying world. Jesus said to the disciples, Seek me and ye shall what? Ye shall find me. In Matthew chapter number 7 in the Sermon on the Mount. We're not even proclaiming the message anymore about what it means to seek Him. That's why you're left here. That's why I'm left here to lead people, to guide people, to disciple people, to teach them how to seek the Lord. Remember the Enoch guy? 
Remember Enoch from our discussion a little bit earlier? Look, look, at, look at his attitude. Jump all the way to Hebrews chapter 5. I'm sorry, Hebrews 11, verse 5. Hebrews 11, verse 5. Enoch, for those of you who may not know, shows up in an interesting chapter here in the book of Hebrews. It's known as God's Hall of Faith. In other words, these were people that really knew what it meant to live lives of faith. And there's a whole list of Old Testament characters that show up in the text Look what is said of Enoch here in, in, in verse number 5. Um, it says, By faith Enoch was what? He was translated that he should not see death. This guy didn't die just like one day if the rapture happened tonight. You're not going to die. He's going to translate you. And he was not found because, bef- because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had what? He had this testimony that he pleased God. In other words, this guy's walk was all about pleasing the Lord. Could you imagine how much simpler our lives would be if we would simply just walk and live lives where we're acknowledging, Lord, I just want to please you today. That was what this guy was about. Look at the next verse. For but without faith, did you catch that? Without faith, it is what? Impossible. Impossible to please Him. So how do we grow that faith? Because without the faith that we need to please Him, there's some things that we need to practically do. That's what I love about scriptures. Everybody have a colon at the end of this phrase? Now He's going to describe for you and for me how it is that you please Him. Look what He says here. For he that cometh to God must what? Must believe that he is. How many people really believe who Jesus Christ is? Right? For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And what else do we need to do? And that he is a rewarder of those that what? Diligently seek him. You'll never please him. You'll never have a testimony that pleases him if you don't know who he is to you. That little, that song that Christy, that Christy Strzok sang the other day, man, the child of God. Do you not really get who you are? That you are his, that he is yours. And when we know that and believe that and embrace that, you know what you're going to do? You're going to want more of him. That's called intimacy. And you know how that intimacy plays out in your life with Him? Now you're seeking Him. You are wanting and desiring to know Him through His Word. You're studying the Psalms and you're seeing the Psalms and you're blown away with the relationship and the intimacy that David had with this guy. With the, 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 this guy David had with God. As a matter of fact, listen to the, these words by David. He says one thing, he says in the 27th chapter, 4th verse of Psalms. He says one thing, there's only one thing, he says, have I desired of the Lord, and that will I, what? And that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, and behold the beauty of the Lord, and inquire in his temple. And what David just says, there's one thing that I desire, and that is to seek him in the house of the Lord. Where's the house of the Lord today? You are it. He lives in you. You can take him wherever you want to take him. If you like a nice, quiet, little private place, like going up to the the mountains up here, these beautiful mountains where we live, do that. Go there. Maybe it's your study. Maybe it's your bedroom. I don't know where it is, but seek him, man. Take your Bible with you and open it up and just pray it and cry out to him. And seek him out and desire nothing more than to get to know him. You know what is so cool? And be thankful in that journey, in that process. You'll get up off your knees and he'll change your view, your perspective of whatever is going on in your life. Or whatever is going on in this world. This is how he works in our lives. 
And that's what chapter 5 is all about, is giving them this extended hope. He's ex- I'm extending this invitation. You just seek me, he says. In verse 4, he says, seek me and ye shall live. In verse 6 of chapter 5, he says, seek the Lord and ye shall live. In Amos 5, 8, he says, seek him that maketh, watch this, I love this, that maketh the seven stars and Orion. Did anybody ever go back and see who created the very constellations that are out there right now that we refer to to this day? Orion is on the southern sky every single night. Who created that? God Almighty. Seek him who created that constellation. He also mentions the seven stars. The seven stars is known in Job chapter 7 as the what? As the Pleiades. That's that little clump that you see in the southeastern sky. A lot for years people thought that was the little dipper. They were, that's not the little dipper. That's the Pleiades. Who created that? The creator, Jesus Christ. And in the text, same as his same man, seek him who created all this. In other words, he wants to remind you and me, man, that there's a bigger picture, there's a bigger purpose for where it is that you live and why you exist. And it's all there in Amos. Over and over, he's making this invitation to follow him. And in the last several verses of Amos 5, verses 16 through 27, the context in those verses, again, by way of review, really, because we already touched on this, he's reminding these people, look at the screen real quick. Now he's going to remind them of this event right here. He's coming back, man. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Tell me that doesn't give you hope. Look at verse 16 of Amos 5. Therefore the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord saith us, wailing shall be in all the streets, and they shall say in all the highways, alas, alas, and they shall call the husbandmen to mourning, and such as are skillful of lamentation to wailing. You know what? It's going to be a crazy time like this world has never seen. We've, we've talked about that in the book of Revelation. We talked about it in Joel chapter 2 a few weeks ago. Look at verse 18. Woe unto you. Verse 17, I'm sorry. And all and in all vineyards shall be wailing, for I will pass through thee, saith the Lord. And woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? For the day of the Lord is darkness and not light. It's going to be a dark time on this planet. The battle of Armageddon. The campaign of our Armageddon. Keep reading and then we'll finish the chapter verse number 19 and if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him or went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and a servant bit him shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light even very dark and no brightness of it I hate I despise your feast days and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies you know what they were doing they were sacrificing their little babies to Molech. But let judgment run down as waters, and righteousness is my mighty stream. Have ye offered, verse 25, have ye offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness for 40 years, O house of Israel? But ye have borne the tabernacle of your Molech and tune your images, the star of your God, which ye made to yourselves. Therefore will I cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, saith the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. Thinking that somehow by sacrificing these innocent little babies, they were worshiping some form or some deity or some God. Chapter number six As a follow-up, just real quick, woe to them, woe to them that are at ease in Zion and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations, to whom the house of Israel came. Pass ye unto Kelmia and see, and from thence go ye to Hamath the great. Then go down to Gath of the Philistines, 
And be they better than these kingdoms, for their border is greater than your border. And ye put away, far away the evil day, and cause the seed of violence to come near. Again, that event is continuing to play out, this event right here. Oops. Right there is what we're reading about. Verse 7, Therefore now shall they go captive with the first that go captive, and the banquet of them that stretch themselves shall be removed. For the Lord God hath sworn by himself, saith the Lord thy God of hosts, I abhor the excellency of Jacob and hate his palaces. Therefore will I deliver up the city with all that is therein. And it shall come to pass, if there remain ten men in one house, that they shall die. For if a man's uncle shall take him up, and he that burneth him to bring out the bones out of the house, and shall say unto him that is by the sides of the house, Is there yet any with thee? And he shall say, No, then shall he say, Hold thy tongue, for we may not make mention of the name of the Lord. For behold, the Lord commandeth, and he will smite the great house with breaches, and the little house which he sins. Verse 12, Shall horses run upon the rock? Will one plow there with oxen? For ye have turned judgment into gall, and the fruit of righteousness into hemlock. Ye which rejoice in a thing of naught, which say, have ye not taken to us horns by our, by our own strength? But behold, I will raise up against you a nation, O house of Israel, saith the Lord, the God of hosts. And they shall afflict you from the entering into the Hamath and into the river of the wilderness. Chapter 6. Israel's punishment declared. But you know what I love about our God? He invites you. Seek the Lord and you shall live. Let's pray. Father, thank you for, Lord, our time together tonight in your word. Lord, thank you so much for the truths in your word that reveal so much about who you are, Lord, and your righteousness. Lord, how much you, because of that righteousness and that holiness about you, Lord God, despise and hate evil and all that it represents. And Lord, I pray and I ask that you would show your grace and mercy amongst this country, amongst this people. The Lord God, as Solomon wrote in Second Chronicles, that if your people would humble themselves and pray, that Lord, you would, you would heal this land. And Lord, I do lift up this country to you now. I ask that your will would be done above all else. And Lord, whatever happens, I pray that the church, the body of Christ, wouldn't lose sight of its purpose and its mission, that we would have the hearts of lions, Lord, that we would be like the Amoses and the Hoseas and the Joels that we find in your word. And Lord, know and embrace and own this great mission that you've bestowed upon us, and that is to be proclaimers of the good news and the hope that only you could give, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.